You are in the ladies' room with Dr. Danica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Danica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Danica. Today, we're talking with Dr. Allison Escalante about one of the biggest epidemics facing Americans, anxiety. Now, chances are pretty high that you've experienced anxiety firsthand. As we've discussed previously in episode 61 of this podcast with psychologist Dr. Cheryl uh, Kingsburg, a study done by the organization Healthy Women revealed that 96% of American women say they've suffered from anxiety. So we should be studying those other 4%. But more alarmingly, 81% said they suffer from it at least weekly. Additional survey findings included that more than 60% of women in the survey experienced a panic attack at some point. 43% of women have never spoken to their healthcare professional about it, even though it does interfere with their activities of daily living. And the leading sources of anxiety in the women surveyed were, number one, financial concerns, number two, situations at work, and number three, relationships with their significant other. Dr. Allison Escalante has had an interesting perspective on the anxiety epidemic as both a parent and as a pediatrician who counsels parents on a daily basis about what she calls the should storm. And I'm going to let her tell you all about that. It's a, it's a fascinating concept. She's a graduate of Princeton University and Rutgers University Robert Wood Johnson School of Medicine and did her pediatric residency training at Duke University and the University of Chicago. She's a former clinical instructor of pediatrics at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine and is currently a practicing physician in Naperville, Illinois. So I know all of you parents there are now Googling her. Uh, she is the Should Storm blog writer for Psychology Today and has done an outstanding TEDx talk called The Parenting Should Storm, which is where I found her. And I highly recommend her uh, talk to all of you. The summary in the bottom line is that she wants to make a dent in the anxiety epidemic by starting at what she calls the most vulnerable point. And that's the place where we can make the biggest potential impact, the parent-child relationship. With that, welcome to the ladies' room. Well, thanks, Dr. Donica. I love this podcast and I love the ladies' room personally. <laughs> So then, you know, I always love to start by asking our guests, what's the most unique, different, interesting, or exciting uh, experience you ever had in a ladies room other than this interview, of course? Well, I would say that my most unique and uh, different experiences are probably not appropriate for a podcast, but oh, well, that's what we love to hear. <laughs> but what I really love is the, uh, the ladies room at Disney World. Because um, it is like this tribe of women who come together <laughs> for just a minute of relief from the crowd. Of course, it's crowded in there, but the pressure and their kids whining and, they're, and, and everybody whining. I mean, I'm not going to pick on the husbands because I think the moms end up whining by the end of Disney too. So I just, I love the camaraderie in there. And I love the way that we actually start talking at the sink and comparing like, parenting notes and how we're dealing with all the sugar and the lines and and everybody gives each other a tip oh this line is short right now and you know it's great i love it so how old are your children so my boys are seven and nine um so and actually they're line. having their their screen time right now because they're off of school so <laughs> they're doing that while we do our podcast yeah okay so everybody make a note the pediatrician says it's okay to use screen time as a babysitter <laughs> Well, you know, within our uh, allotted time frame of the AAP recommended two hours or less. <laughs> <laughs> so I made, the biggest mistake I made as a parent was having my children before there were iPads. Uh, <laughs> I remember when uh, the Game Boy was first uh, came out and my son was about the right age for Game Boy. And I thought that was the greatest invention of all time. <laughs> but the best, dinos, uh, the best babysitter I had when my kids were little was Barney the Dinosaur, uh, which you could say whatever bad things you want about Barney, but I love Barney. So anyway, get back to those embarrassing uh, 
things that you didn't want to talk about, about what happened to the ladies room. That's really what I won't oh, tell anybody. Oh, goodness. They generally involve uh, people who are ill. I don't think we want to discuss that. <laughs> well, that's not you that know, exciting. Jury rigging cleanups and so forth. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll pass on that. Yeah. So tell us, how did you come up with this concept of the should storm? Right. So, I mean... I was trained for high intensity medical situations. And um, one of my last rotations before I finished was an intensive care uh, rotation um, at University of Chicago. And then I came out to my first practice in the suburbs um, and was astonished, um, astonished at parents coming in and saying, hey doc, uh, she's had a sniffle for about six hours now and we want to nip it in the bud. <laughs> Um, and that was just a simple, common example of the level of anxiety that I started being exposed to. But more than that, uh, it quickly became clear that the kids were, were struggling. Um, and uh, so I started digging. Um, and I had some, always an interest in how people think, how they work, um, why we do what we do. That's why I studied history as an undergraduate. And I had been doing a lot of supplementary education in, in psychology. Over time, I'll cut to the chase. <laughs> it became clear that the available solutions were not working. There were so many great books, um, and I felt like I didn't have anything to add to all of this really great advice out there, except that when people use this advice, they often seemed burdened or more anxious, or I've got to do it this way, or I'm going to mess them up forever. Oh my gosh, I, I, I don't know. They don't listen to me, but if I yell at them, won't that traumatize them for life? And it, it just was this terrible catch-22. And certain techniques would work a little bit, but nothing seemed to be making a dent in the key issue. You quoted some of the statistics and um, you quoted the statistics on women, but the statistics on children are pretty frightening as well. And the most recent one is from the, AA, uh, the APA um, survey on stress in America and 91% of kids in Gen Z are reporting that they have experienced physical or emotional uh, symptoms of depression or anxiety. Repeat um, that. What percent? 91. So nine out of 10. Yes. And then in terms of meeting diagnostic criteria, um, 30, more than 30%, it's about 33% of our kids will meet criteria for an anxiety disorder by the age of 18. That goes up above 40% when you add in depression. Um, and those are just the kids that are presenting to their doctor enough for the doctor to be able to make that diagnosis. So it's very alarming. Um, and the most important thing I say before we talk anymore is I am not blaming parents. Okay? But that's, of course, the first thing we all feel and think of. And I admit that when I was watching your TED Talk, I was thinking of all the things I did wrong. And of course, my children are out of the nest and they're launched and they're happy, healthy, successful adults. But I still was beating myself up for everything that I hadn't thought about as a parent in terms of anxiety and depression and pressure that I was putting on them and all the things I did wrong. Why do we do that? Of course you did things wrong. We all do things wrong. I mean, if I, no one would listen to me about uh, parenting subjects if I told all the things I've done wrong with my kids. <laughs> but- it, it, it really Wait, are you accusing me of being human? I am. I am. And you nope. know, doctors, we're not allowed, we're not like, we're, we believe that we're supposed to be more than human, right? But that's ridiculous. Um, but I will say this right off the bat, once I finally had my big intuitive pop moment and I came up with this technique and I started using it, um, things really started to change. And I, I'm not saying I don't make mistakes because I sure do, but the tone in the home changed. And then I started um, doing a lot more of what I had always hoped to be doing as a parent, you know? So okay, I think so that tell was us cool. what the insight was. What was the light bulb? Right. So, I mean, basically um, I was uh, sitting um, with uh, a, yet another mom uh, mm -hmm. who was completely burdened by the shoulds about breastfeeding. Okay. I should breastfeed or my child's IQ will be ruined and they will be, they'll get a terrible disease and they'll be uh, 
they'll get diabetes and they're going to be screwed up for life. Um, and I've been reading all these articles and I should breastfeed, but it hurts and my nipples are bleeding and it's not working and I can't sleep because I'm up pumping and you know, sh I should do this, I should do that. And then she started throwing out all the questions. Should I go back to the lactation consultant? Should I try a nipple shield? Should I try this? Should I try that? And in that moment, I said to her what I'd said to a number of parents over the years. Um, and I said, do you realize that it's not your breast milk that your baby needs? Mm -hmm. That you are what your baby needs? And she was really shocked by that. Um, she, she started to engage. Um, she wanted to believe that, but that was really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and in that moment, wanting to help her, wanting to help myself, wanting to help all these parents who were trying so hard, but frankly, that, that same kind of frantic parenting, like I've got to get it right about breastfeeding, leads into frantic parenting going on. I've got to do it right here. They got to be in the right activities. I got to make sure they get the right tutoring. I got to, oh, they, they got to obey this, but, but I've got to uh, meet their emotional needs. So, you know, and we just see this franticness and then it makes the kids kind of anxious, right? So in that moment, it just came out of me. Um, and this had been after 10 years of study on this subject. And I said to her, every time you feel a should, sigh. Take a big breath and let it out as slow as you can. See, see your baby, see what's going on. See what you think she really needs. Mm -hmm. and, and then- what does taking a deep breath or what does a sigh actually do physiologically? Sure. So um, let's dig into that. But um, basically when we sigh, this is a quick and dirty way to get activated on um, what some of the very exciting neuroscience research has shown. In the last 20 years, um, it, the understanding of the autonomic nervous system has evolved. And we know that when we're anxious, we are um, reacting as though we're under attack. And this probably comes from a deep millennia of human history, right? right. Um, but we're not really under attack when breastfeeding is difficult. <laughs> um, you know? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, you're right. You're right. There is a whole, that's the should storm, right? We have this storm of you should do this and you're not enough and, and you should do that, right? You're absolutely right. We are under attack. Okay. Well, and, and I personally have remember the experience of uh, having a difficult uh, breastfeeding experience with my first child. I know it was difficult because with the second one, it was a totally different experience. But I even had nightmares. Uh, when I was in college, uh, there were protesters uh, who marched around um, the main building of campus protesting about Princeton's investments in South Africa. And the chant was mm. Prince, Princeton divest. And I would have nightmares that I was in one of those protests chanting, yeah. nursing sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love and it, it wasn't just a one-time nightmare. It was a recurrent <laughs> right. nightmare. Oh. And I actually came to the brilliant realization that it was not illegal in the state of New Jersey to give a baby a bottle. Um, <laughs> and I found that the biggest myth was that uh, this myth of nipple confusion. My child had no issues with nipple confusion. He had no problems getting a bottle or a or breastfed uh, and that was my solution i'm really glad that worked out for you <laughs> you know um it, it's true a lot of people can do bottle and it doesn't cause any problems with breastfeeding and some people it seems to help their breastfeeding mm -hmm. and other kids it seems to create a problem that we have to work with the breastfeeding consultants but the point about it is that i got to say two things on that one um it's not about the breastfeeding, right? It's about that message. You have to do it perfectly or your child's going to be messed up for life. And whatever the subject is that comes up, that's the issue. It's just that it hits us so hard right in the beginning when we need to be bonding with our baby, when we need to be building our sense of confidence as a parent and we're freaking out about breastfeeding. I had my first son at the height of breastfeeding uh, advocacy, and I was getting daily emails, doctor emails about like from the breastfeeding research about how um, important it was and how my child would be disadvantaged if I didn't breastfeed. And, um, you know, I really support breastfeeding. I'm a, I'm a pediatrician, but um, I think that it's very clear 
um, that uh, the advantages, when you really look at the statistics, are small. It's a small advantage, um, and it's not worth destroying a family's mental health over. Uh, so that's all I'm saying. But um, the recurring nightmare about Princeton, I have one too. Um, different nightmare, but uh, I, my recurring nightmare is wandering around campus trying to find my calculus class. And every time I have this dream, the campus looks different. And I cannot find the building or the class. And when I finally arrive, it's halfway through the semester, and I'm so far behind that there's no way I'm not going to flunk the class. So I have, an, I have a recurring nightmare about calculus at Princeton also. Mm. And that one is also that I've slept through all the classes, and then I show up to the exam completely unprepared. So I actually consulted a dream expert right. who's a PhD, who's also a Princeton graduate, and he just laughed and he said, that's the classic type A individual dream. Uh, and the reason it's calc, and I said, why is it always calculus or physics? Right. And he said, it's always calculus or physics because you can't baffle your way through it. Right. You, know, you can't fake your way through it at English all. English or history yep. or uh, something else. You could write a brilliant essay on, you know, with very little knowledge <laughs> uh, because you know how to game the exam. But in calculus, there's no, you know, there's no faking it. So, you know, actually I should have him on for, to do a podcast. That would be very be fun. Yeah. It's clearly a dream about being unprepared and being overwhelmed. Right. And being exposed. And you being, know, exposed. being exposed for not knowing everything. Right. Uh, and at its basic level, it's an anxiety dream. It is I mean, an anxiety When I wake dream. up from that nightmare and when I have it now, and I am 40 years now past taking calculus in college, um, I wake up in a cold sweat and I have to convince myself. I have to say, okay, you graduated from college. You graduated from medical school. You're a grown up. This is all in the past and it still comes up. But that is a basic anxiety uh, dream at, at, you know, at its most basic commonality. Well, this brings us back to sighing so perfectly, right? Because <laughs> what do you do when you're in those anxiety centers? Um, what's really interesting is the research um, on this has shown um, Porges, uh, Dr. Porges is the one who's done this research. And um, basically, when you do a very, very slow out breath, um, so we have all been taught about the deep breath. Um, and some people who have, do yoga have realized about the slow out breath. But basically, when we breathe out as slowly as we humanly can, we tell our autonomic nervous system that we are not, in fact, in danger. And then we move into the centers uh, called the ventral vagus nerve, where we're now in the calm and connected social centers. And this is huge, and it works ridiculously fast. Um, so that uh, even in the most stressful of situations, I've found uh, that one to three breaths is enough to make a big difference. And this is hysterical because anyone who knows me well, especially when I was younger, would think of me as a major stress ball. So um, that's pretty funny. So you sigh and then you see, now that is clearly a mindfulness step, right? You mm -hmm. see your baby, you see the situation, see body language. Whether you do it when you sigh or see, try to can see how you're doing, see what your feelings are, you know? I try to ask myself, what is my should in this situation? Like what is the rule that's being broken that's so intense, you know? Um, but this is the part I love. And this is so perfect talking uh, about being overachieving, right? Mm -hmm. And that is um, that when you get to the start step, now it's about messing up on purpose mm -hmm. to grow. I love it, right? Um, and this was, I think this is why this was so hard for me to get to because I want to do it right the first time and every time. And instead, motherhood brought me to my knees as a perfectionist because I can't possibly. Well, and one of the reasons we can't possibly do it, quote unquote, right, is there's no right answers. Mm -mm. Uh, one of the best things I ever heard about parenting is there are hundreds of wrong answers, but there's no right answer. Uh, I think this might be why generations of parents or the generation of parents before me might have had it really easy 
because they all believed, or an overwhelming majority of them believed in Dr. Spock. Right. Dr. They had a Spock script. Was the only book out there. Mm-hmm. And that was the way to do everything, was whatever Dr. Spock said. So it was yeah. much simpler. It was a much simpler time, if you believe that. Uh, I remember when I was a new parent uh, and my sister would come to visit, and she's about 10 years younger than I am. Uh, and she would look at all these parenting magazines and parenting books. Not that I bought them all, but of course, people would send them to me. So I would have them. And she called Parents Magazine, Petrified Parents Magazine. And she was like doing a comedy routine based upon all the dire warnings Dire warnings. You know, yep. in this magazine, because we're yep. all so afraid um, mm. of messing up our children for life because of one mistake, either that we commit or that they commit. Right. You know, that's the other thing. I think we're afraid of letting them make mistakes. Right. Which, um, and I've tried to figure out how that came to be a thing. And I compare myself and my parents, for example. Uh, And of course, now we have the internet of everything. So we're just bombarded with so much more information. But also my parents had six children. They didn't have the luxury of (laughs) obsessing about each and every little thing that each one of us did. I only had two. So, and I had my children when I was much older and much quote unquote better educated. Uh, so I had a lot more knowledge about things to be fearful of. I mean, my parents had their children when they were much younger and maybe didn't know better. I think you're echoing a lot of the things that have been picked up by the researchers and the writers that have looked at this phenomenon. Um, size of families, um, age at which we have our families, right? I mean, my parents were barely out of their own childhood when they had kids. Um, they were in their early 20s, right? Yeah, and they just kind of had to 20s. do it, you know? And um, uh, so a lot of these things have been uh, delineated. Um, certainly, uh, to quote uh, the Coddling of the American Mind, um, which is a must read book, um, but uh, you know, have a glass of wine available. It's pretty upsetting until you get to the second half. Um, but they talk about uh, the rise of the culture of safetyism. And I think that's the best word I've heard of the many people that have described how this came about. Um, I identify it a little differently because I'm always looking at this from the parent's viewpoint as opposed to from a historian's or a sociologist's viewpoint. What does it feel like to be us? Why is this happening? And, and it feels like to us that we've got to get it right mm-hmm. all the time. And that if we don't, um, we're going to harm our children and everyone's going to blame us, including them. <laughs> um, but even worse, there's a huge confusion about what is good for a kid and what isn't, right? And as soon as we start to com- think that a child's upset feelings mean that they're being harmed, um, we're stuck. What are we supposed to do now? Um, and that is, that's probably the hardest belief to overcome. Um, and I personally think that we can confront that belief, but I don't think most of today's parents have much success doing that, right? You could say, yeah, you're right. It's, it is good for them to experience difficult things. So they get bigger at it, but, but you know, I mean, not actually hurting themselves, right? You know, it's just very, very hard to do that from a cognitive place. Um, And that's why I've come up with more of like an action step, because what I keep hearing again and again from people that try this is, this was great. I I, I actually got to stop overthinking my parenting and um, I'm just doing it. And all of a sudden things are changing. Okay. So the action step is the sigh, the C, the start. Right. Um, Then what? So that's it. So you start. And so what you do is when you you start something, um, you start nothing. Uh, You start the wrong thing. So maybe you get it right. Great. That's something that you've learned. And you can put that away as in this situation on this day when my kid was in that mood, that worked. Great. Um, Maybe you're going to get it wrong. And clearly that blew up in my face. Um, And and this is important because the next thing that happens here is you hear that voice of blame. Um, and dads hear this, moms hear this, but that voice that says, oh, I should have done it differently, right? Oh, I shouldn't have messed up like that. What was I thinking? Well, that's a should, right? So immediately you sigh, see, and start again. Um, 
Starting with nothing is really important, and this is a tool I think we underuse, just, uh, just starting with silence and seeing where it goes. I think this is much easier when your kids are out of the twos and the threes, and they're not actively trying to throw themselves off of the kitchen table all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, wait, um, get back to me when your kids are teenagers. Oh, I know. I can't, I can't wait. Um, but, um, but you know, we need something we can do under pressure. It starts to build because you're connecting with yourself, right? Not just your cognitive space. You're connecting with your body by breathing. You're connecting with the world around you without trying to change it immediately. And then you're doing something. You start to move into an experimental figure it out mindset. And that is a completely different place to come from, from I know these things that are good practices and I'm going to apply them. Right. Um, and I talk a lot about the toolkit because then the ne- people's next question is, well, that's great and all, uh, but what specifically should I do, right? And, and to okay. some extent, that's beside the point, right? But to some extent, yeah, I get that. That is, that is the point. Right. So, and so and I recently yeah. had a patient who was um, suffering from new onset generalized anxiety um, and it was a young adult. And she kept saying to me, but what do I do? when Mm -hmm. I feel anxiety or when I feel a panic attack. And I didn't have really good answers. Um, Of course, with the panic attack, one thing we tell people that's very similar to your sigh uh, example is about breathing into a brown paper bag. Right, right. Um, And the reason is because when we're anxious, what we physiologically, what we often do is we're hyperventilating. Exactly. We're actually feeling like we need more air because we're preparing or more oxygen. We're preparing for that fight or flight. But what we're actually doing is blowing off too much CO2. Right. So we actually need a balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide. I actually learned this long before I was in college as a competitive swimmer. Right. So, you know, competitive swimmers really focus a lot on exhaling slowly as opposed to, you know, what you were talking about, as opposed to exhaling quickly, or what a lot of people who aren't experienced swimmers naturally do is they gasp for air. Right. And they're trying to keep taking more air in without blowing out any of you know their CO2. That's so, so funny because I was a swimmer too. And I'm just thinking about the way that I that I was breathing. Go on. That's you know very, very important. Um, so I think that was the only thing I had to offer her. Uh, yeah. the other thing was recommending actual physical exercise. Right. Because right. again, when we're preparing for when we're feeling anxious that we're ready for a fight or flight, we it seemed intuitive to me and I did not do as much uh homework and reading as you did, but it just always seemed intuitive to me maybe as an athlete that you need a physical response right. to a a fight or flight situation. And I actually came up with what I advise parents all the time was a great punishment uh, activity for my kids. Well, the first thing I came up with, I thought this whole timeout thing was bullshit. Um, so I'm sorry if you're an advocate of it. I, that didn't work for me. What I realized was I was the one who usually needed the timeout, not the kids. And I would say, okay, mommy's going to my room for a few minutes for timeout. Uh, but I didn't like how I felt uh, when there was a behavior issue involving the kids. And I didn't like losing my cool. I wanted to be calm. And I used to watch this, my favorite TV show was JAG, which was about, it dealt with young Marines. And I thought, how do they get these 18 and 19 year old, you know, rebellious men and women fighters to have perfect discipline? And the answer came to me. It was drop and give me 15. It was push ups. And I decided that push-ups was the perfect punishment uh, for my children with any dis- misbehavior. And I announced one day this was the rule. Uh, my daughter was also a gymnast, and her coach said I needed to uh, have her increase her upper body strength. And I said, what am I going to do, make her do push-ups? And the light bulb you know, went off. So any misbehavior, and I told them in advance, and I told them what the infractions were, and I said, for any of these infractions, you're just going to give me 10 push-ups, And they have to be perfect or we start over and there's no backtalk. 
And what it was, was a really good physical outlet. And it allowed me to maintain my cool because I didn't have to yell. I didn't have to have a fit. I didn't have to decompensate. And I got so good at it. I didn't even have to say, give me 10 pushups. I just had to raise one eyebrow. And then the offending child, uh, usually one, not the other, would say, okay, I know I'm doing my pushups. She actually once said, I'm doing my pushups, but it was worth it. <laughs> so I love that. And that's going right in my toolkit. In fact, I might be announcing this uh, to my kids today. Um, <laughs> but, but this is exactly what I'm talking about, is that what you did there was you used what connected with you, what made sense for you with your temperament and your kids, right? So. What I talk a lot about is um, taking things that are shoulds, right? And again, this is not an accusation against the wonderful parenting advice because there's some really solid stuff out there. But what we do is we turn it into this burdensome should, right? So we need to take that. We need to put ourselves back in the lead. That's what SciSee and Start is about. And then if you're not sure what to start, you reach into your bag of tools, your toolkit. Mm -hmm. And that's where you put the things that have worked in the past. That's where you put that thing you read in that great article the other day, or that thing you heard from your friend and you thought, yeah, that's a great idea. Like I am definitely going to use pushups. Right. Um, and, and you just pull out different tools, but because it changes to where now, instead of you pushing things that you know, your kids should do, you're coming from yourself more the kids start to build trust. They start to see that you're noticing them. You get less screams of you never listen. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, what's really interesting is if you start using this type of, of way of uh, approaching it and you start talking about it honestly with the kids, they start using it. The nice thing about push-ups too is they're extremely portable. Yes, I love it. They you realize I will absolutely be using anywhere. them now. And technically it is corporal punishment. Um, I guess so. Uh, because, <laughs> because I once suggested to the headmaster at the school that they should do this at school. And he said, that's corporal punishment. We can't do it. Um, oh. But I was like, well, I can. Um, but it doesn't involve any kind of, you know, physical contact between the parent and the child. Uh, there was one time one of my children told me I needed to do push-ups, And he was right. And I did. Good. Um, yeah. On a previous episode of this podcast, um, talking about push-ups, uh, Barbara Hannah Grufferman, who is a healthy uh, aging expert, uh, talks about how we have such sedentary lifestyles uh, as adults, yeah. and she recommends push-ups just as taking a break and getting up from your desk and doing your push-ups or your jumping jacks or planking. So push-ups are not in my uh, wheelhouse anymore, unless I'm in the water. <laughs> Maybe planking. is yeah. a really good yeah. break. And that was one thing that I put in my toolkit from her. So what are the things that can you offer parents to put in their toolkits? And I think we need two toolkits, right? We need one for how we deal with the kids and one for how we deal with us. That's right. That's right. And so that brings us back to your patient where she was having panic attacks and you weren't quite sure what to tell her. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, with that, where you get into somebody who's really struggling with anxiety, um, that's where the therapists are so great because they have so many. That's what I did tell her. She right, needed to see a therapist and she needed medication. Yeah. Um, I knew and, that, but, but I didn't have know, any other, anything else to have all kinds of quick and dirty ways now. Um, one of my favorite is tapping, where you actually tap along your acupressure points while breathing, while confronting your thoughts. Um, and so it's almost like a mixture of cognitive behavioral therapy where you're looking at your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a, a verb, you verbalize self-compassion. Um, so one of the key phrases to tapping is, I deeply and completely accept myself. Um, and then, uh, you, uh, you actually go along the acupressure points. Now, advocates of it say that that's because it's along the meridian system, but whether or not you believe in that, um, it's definitely a way of getting physically connected with your body. You're touching your body and you're connecting that. And we, um, the more we understand um, the mind-body connection, the um, autonomic system, um, the way that touch and sound and all of these things, um, integrate us. I mean, that's, that's the word I'm looking for. We seem to have lost Dr. Escalante. 
I am going to try to get her back. Uh, but in the meantime, I want everybody to think about what are the things that are in your toolkit? What are the things that you recommend uh, when you or someone you love is experiencing stress or anxiety? One of the things we learned from the Healthy Women survey is that uh, many people turn to maladaptive uh, reasons and uh, treatments, maladaptive uh, methods for dealing with their anxiety. So it shouldn't be any surprise that one of the most common ways that people dealt with their anxiety was through alcohol um, or taking medication, uh, which is really okay once in a while, but is not really our first choice. And when I'm talking about taking medication, I'm talking about something uh, abortive therapy, like a Xanax or a Valium, as opposed to a regular prescribed daily uh, therapy. Uh, of course, therapy is, you know, with a therapist is an extremely adaptive mechanism for dealing with anxiety, as is exercise. All kinds of data have shown that daily aerobic exercise uh, is equivalent uh, to uh, an, any kind of antidepressant or anxiety medication for people who have mild to moderate, moderate uh, symptoms, but also exercising in the moment. So saying, you know what, I need to remove myself from the situation and I need to go for a run or, you know, I need to go spend uh, 15 minutes on the elliptical machine. Uh, calling a friend can be very helpful in anxiety. And basically what that's doing is offloading. Uh, I often find calling a friend and talking about their problems makes me often feel a lot better or uh, about my own situation or forgetting uh, my own problems. Uh, what Dr. Escalante was talking about, about uh, pressure, I think we might have her back. Do we have you Hi. back? Yes, give me one second. I went on my phone, my Wi-Fi cut out. Okay. So we have her back. In the meantime, Allison, I have just been talking about the things that are my toolkit and asking people to think about what uh, tools they have in their toolkits for those situations when either they are feeling anxious or they're dealing with their children who are feeling anxious. So we'll let you uh, get resituated and uh, we'll let you tell us more about the tools that are in your toolkit. Well, there we go. It looks like I'm set up. So yes, you are back. Can you hear me? I can. Good. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I think that when you start to get into tools, um, this gets into questions of where it is worth considering what's best practice when we raise kids. Um, and there, um, it's worth taking a step back, which is really hard. Everyone wants to know, yes, but what should I do, right? Mm -hmm. But the step back is to ask, what are my goals? So current parenting, um, it's, it's very confusing what people's goals are, right? We want our kids to be happy and successful, but we also want to keep them safe. We want them to, um, we do ultimately want them to handle things, but we also want to make sure it's not too hard for them. And so um, because of this confusion about what our goals are, our parenting can be a little bit erratic. If we remember what parenting is about in the first place, which is raising adults, right? The, the purpose- Raising fully functional, independent adults. Correct. And so, um, and so this is one of those um, sigh, see, and start moments. Honey, I'm sorry the Wi-Fi's out. Can you please do something else for 10 more minutes? <laughs> okay, we are now gonna watch Dr. Allison Escalante demonstrate how to uh, distract a child try, when there's no Wi-Fi. Try playing Super Mario Kart, honey. Oh, I hate that game. You hate that game? I'll tell you what, I will troubleshoot this as soon as I'm done with Dr. Donica, and uh, I will make sure you get the full amount of screen time we agreed on. Can you be patient for 10 minutes? Okay, we got a whineful yes, we succeeded. <laughs> Well, that was very <laughs> successful. Uh, my daughter, when she was young, made me, I had a home office and she made me a paper plate that said um, yes on one side and no on the other side, which was, yeah. you know, saying that they were allowed to enter or not. 
And on the no side, she wrote under that bullet points. And one of them I remembered was, what, don't you have another parent you could go to? (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I love that so much. It's Martin Luther King Day and they're off of school. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So you are showing us how, you know, successful parenting involves multitasking. And this is what we have to do. Yeah. Yeah, there were many times I gave lectures holding a baby when the babysitter didn't show up, or there was one time I actually was nursing in the back of a conference room when I was about to be the speaker. Uh, There were many times I did interviews with the kids sitting there or listening. And my most successful time was when my daughter, I was doing an interview, a radio interview by phone on the HPV vaccine, which had just Mm -hmm. come out at the time. And my daughter was about 11 and she had a serious, serious vaccine phobia and needle phobia, like to the point where she knew she had a pediatrician visit, she would start crying a week in advance uh, just because she was afraid she would have a vaccine or a needle. Anyway, she stood stood there quietly and I gave her the sign that she, you know, could stay there, but she could, had to be quiet. And I think that was like this. Um, And she listened (laughs) to the whole thing. And I was, I was being asked about the controversy with the HPV vaccine. And I was right. saying, this is not a medical controversy. This is a manufactured controversy. And I talked about how, you know, when I was in medical school, we used to dream of the far off year 2000, when maybe we would have, you know, a cure or a vaccine for some types of cancer. And this was right. the first time we had a vaccine to prevent a cancer. Uh, anyway, I get off the interview and my vaccine phobic needle phobic daughter says to me vaccine cancer where do i sign up <laughs> and from that day on she had no fear of vac and she hadn't had the hpv vaccine yet at that time right um because i was now dreading the vaccine phobia right the drama um, yeah. the drama and she was only 11 so i figured i could wait a year till it had yeah. been on the market for a year Um, anyway, from that time on, she had no fear of vaccines or needles. And what occurred to me is I had never explained to her why she needed these vaccines and what these vaccines could do. And in all honesty, how many of us ever explain to our kids, you know, what diphtheria is? In fact, I don't think most doctors could even adequately describe what diphtheria is. You know why? Because most of us never see a case of diphtheria anymore, ever, in our entire careers. That's right. And that also goes for pertussis, although pertussis, of course, as you know, is making a comeback. But yeah, also I've seen tetanus. It plenty of times. Yeah, most of us have never seen a case of tetanus. Right. Um, so, you know, hopefully, and I, I, until 10 years ago, I could have said most of us have never seen a case of polio. But polio, of course, is now making a comeback in certain parts of our country because not only are kids vaccine phobic, but now parents are vaccine phobic. And I don't want to get into that. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast that someday we'll, we'll talk about, but talk to me in our last few minutes about other specific things that are in the toolkit that parents can do for themselves and that they can offer to their children. Well, I think that when you look at the parents' toolkit, um, number one, it's of course the calming down and centering, right? Which you get right in with SICE and start, but you can also uh, uh, take on a meditation practice. That sounds very overwhelming for people, um, but I love to recommend a falling asleep meditation. Um, and I particularly like um, to download those with nice ocean sounds and kind of listen to that as I fall asleep. And that brings me to the second tool, because one of my favorite meditations is meditation for self-compassion. And this is a crucial tool. Uh, And it's funny, this is something that modern psychology is rediscovering, but that is actually in place in most of the ancient wisdom traditions. When we treat ourselves with mercy, when we, when that internal dialogue inside our head, instead of it saying, you loser, why didn't you do that? Or you should, oh, um, when we change it to the same kind and compassionate voice that we might use with a good friend, um, we are more successful, more confident, more flexible in our thinking, and it changes the game because when you can treat yourself with compassion, 
suddenly you see your kids differently as well. Um, the overparenting epidemic leads us to do two things. We become, we hover too much and we coddle our kids, but we also in our stress become hypercritical. And we, we know we're not supposed to, and we don't want to be, but we do. Okay. Because we're hypercritical of ourselves. So if we can start to turn that around and use a practice of self-compassion, you know what? I blew it there. I'm going to apologize. Uh, my thing was always that mommy deserves a timeout because mommy messed up. So I take a timeout. You apparently do push-ups. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I recommend push-ups. I didn't say that I personally do them. them. Yeah, got it. Um, you know, so, uh, and it, it, but when we have self-compassion and we're not burdened by shame and shoulds, then we can take that responsibility for ourselves right in front of our kids and we can make them less afraid to take responsibility for us for themselves and that's the whole problem with anxious overparenting is that parents are being pushed to take full responsibility for our children taking away our kids opportunity to take that responsibility for themselves and we want them to do that gradually appropriately at each developmental stage but if we if we don't shift if we don't say you know what, buddy, um, you're responsible to put your dishes away. And if you don't, there's going to be a, re a consequence. And I know you feel bad about it, but, but um, you're going to survive those big feelings or something along those lines. It actually sounds kind of old school, um, mm -hmm. except the difference was old school was your feelings don't matter. Just do what you're supposed to do. Right. We've, we've learned. And so this is the other tool that I think is very useful in modern parenting that I think is very good is an awareness of emotional intelligence and a use of um, emotion coaching. So early on, you can start to teach your kids, oh, you know, you're yelling at me right now and I noticed your fists are balled up. You know, sometimes when I'm doing that, I'm angry. Do you think you might be angry right now? Um, and when we teach kids to identify their emotions, they can uh, develop much more self-control. But the final mistake the parenting, the overparenting epidemic does is we identify it and then we take the responsibility away for, our, our, uh, for that emotion from our kids by giving in to them or over comforting, okay? So the final step is that's your feeling. Now, what do you think you can do about it, mm -hmm. you know? So I guess the last thing I want to say, and it's not a direct tool, it's not one, two, three magic, which is a good basic parenting system, um, <laughs> is um, treating your kids like you know they're capable. Um, and that was something I did in a messy way, but I started doing that when my son was about 18 months old, that I knew he was capable of managing some things for himself or managing his, his feelings. Um, and I knew that because I had an advantage of uh, reading some stuff that a lot of parents didn't have access to, <laughs> but it's remarkable. They really are capable of a lot more than they think we are. They are, or than we think they are. So, yeah, I think the punchline there too is obviously we need different tools in our toolkits depending on how old they are, uh, right. and depending on right. what age and stage they're in. Uh, you know, and I think of, you know, when you mentioned the 18 month old, you know, I, I must've said, use your words, you know, like a hundred thousand right. times. Right. Uh, interestingly, when my children were teenagers, I sometimes had to say, use your words. Use your words. Yeah. yeah <laughs> or we use proper use words. Still. We still use that phrase <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Use words that are actually in the dictionary. <laughs> you clearly have to go, what is the most important thing you want parents to know? You can do this. You don't need a particular technique. Your kids just need you. And they can do this too. And I know the world feels big and overwhelming and scary, but we are still human beings and we are still capable of remarkable perseverance and creativity and innovation because that's what we've done. And now I have to help my little guy who is melting down over here. <laughs> he has been life. waiting very patiently. And uh, in my toolkit, uh, I would advise thanking him for waiting patiently. Um, I agree. He did wait the 10 minutes that you asked him to. Uh, and that was just a really good demonstration of really good parenting. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Just real quickly, where can people find you? What's your website? 
Sure. So you can find me at shouldstorm.com. Um, and that links to the two minute videos I do with tips and tricks on specific issues. Um, my writing on the blog and on psychology today, um, as well as the Ted talk. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Now go take care of him. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye. That's all we have time for today, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.